Good evening. It is, re <laughs> it is really good to be here with you tonight. I'm uh, so thankful uh, that everyone was able to make it. Uh, I want to go ahead and, and wish all the fathers in here a very happy Father's Day. Hope you've had a great one. I will go ahead and let you know a few things, uh, some, some who are on our prayer list. I mentioned this morning, Doug Smithson has been moved to NHC in Columbia for rehab. And it, take note, if you plan on sending him a card or anything, uh, that the address that's in the bulletin is not correct. Um, the, the correct address is 1510 uh, Trotwood Avenue, and that's room 1506. Uh, it says in the bulletin 1505. So. Just, it's 1510. Uh, and as I mentioned this morning, they are not allowing visitors. So uh, please use that address not to visit, but to send cards. Um, uh, Ronnie Mullins did have surgery on Friday. Uh, I, I believe he's home now and doing well. Uh, and so uh, thankful for that. A uh, few things to be aware of that are coming up. Uh, I think I announced this morning about VBS. It is coming up and there will be a kickoff on Sunday, July 4th. Uh, but also leading up to that, July 1st and 2nd, uh, there will be some work days here at the building that start at 9 o'clock and lunch will be provided. And so if you can help, uh, that would be very much appreciated. I forgot to mention this morning, I wanted to let you know, I know some have asked about it. Uh, you probably noticed these in the back or maybe you have. Uh, bookmarks that go along that uh, for Southern Hills and, and there's uh, you know study type material on here the plan of salvation and things uh, some passages that are important to know and so that'd be great for you to use or to hand out to people uh, that, that might be interested um, and so just wanted to let you know that these are free for the taking so take one two or several and and hand them out uh, and that would be a great thing for you to do and that's all that I have for our announcements this evening. If you'll bow with me, we'll go ahead and begin with a prayer. Our dear and holy Father, we love you and we're so thankful that we could be together tonight. God, we pray that our time together will be good for us, that it'll be encouraging to us, and it'll be a time where we could focus on, on you, where we could set our minds on things that are good and holy and lovely and Father, we pray that our time will help us draw closer to one another, help us draw closer to you. We pray that you be glorified through our worship tonight. Our Father, we love you, and it's through your Son, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Good evening. Our first song tonight will be number 510 on Jordan's Stormy Banks.
Our next song will be Surround Us, Lord. This isn't in the books, and it might be a little bit new to some of you. Could I see a quick show of hands? Who knows this song? Okay, pretty good. We will, uh, we will lead this then. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people. As the mountains surround Before opening scripture and prayer, we'll sing number 216, He Leadeth Me.
Good evening. Today I will be reading from Proverbs 1, 1 through 6. Again, that is Proverbs 1, 1 through 6. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, judgment, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel, to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. Let's pray together. Our Lord, our God, our Father, our eternal Father, as we celebrate Father's Day here, our minds on this day and every first day of the week center on you, our Father in heaven, who wants good gifts for us if we'll only but seek you. As we've just sung, help us to surround ourselves with you. We ask that you surround us, that you lead us. We pray that you'll accept our songs of praise to you. Help us to love you more than anything on this earth. Anything, any person, any family member, let them not get in the way of our love for you. Lord, we are thankful for each and every father on this particular day. I pray that you will lead us as fathers, no matter what point in life and our families we may be. Pray a special blessing for those that are new fathers, young fathers, for those that are expecting that May this time next year be fathers. We pray for the young families. We have challenges along life's way at different times and ages. Help us to always seek solace in you and your promises. Lord, there are those that are struggling at this time with health that we pray that, pray that you will be with them, comfort them. Return them to the portion of health that they wish and the quality of life that they enjoy. If it be your will that they'll be back with us very soon. Pray for Doug Smithson and his recovery. For Ronnie after his surgery. Pray for Jimmy Lincoln and many others that have struggled at different times with health, that you will bless them. Lord, we're all getting older, and we pray especially for those that are uh, older of our congregation that you will give them a special blessing as health sometimes fails them. Help us to encourage one another, to lift each other up, to long for heaven, to long to be together, to sing praises to you. Oh, we have opportunity right all around us. Help us to look for those opportunities. Help us to want this church here at this location to have to tear down these walls and build a larger, a larger auditorium. Help us not to be selfish with your word, but to look for those that are lost. They need you. Help us not to be shy, but to be bold. Pray for this upcoming VBS that will be successful. Thankful for all those that are working hard to make that so, that that'll be an outreach here in the community as well. Lord, I pray for our seniors that are on a trip, that you will bless them with safe travels. Pray for them in this time of life, especially as they're in transition, that you will guide them, especially whatever work that they choose, that they will be close to you, no matter what path that takes them on. Lord, we fail many times. You know us inside out. Many times we, we struggle with different things. We pray that you will make us strong. Help us to be, be that strength, a pillar of strength to those that are around us. We're all human, we make mistakes. 
Help us to want to be close to you in all that we do. I pray for each and every elder in this congregation. Pray for strength and wisdom to always be in your word. To know that you will always be with us no matter what comes life's way. Challenging times in this country that we seem to be under. Help us to be that steady hand. Lord, we're thankful for your son. Help us to never forget that. Help us to always long for heaven. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. If you're using your songbook tonight, you can mark number 125. We'll sing that at the end of the lesson. Well, for the lesson, let's stand and sing number 253. It is the third Sunday, and as I try to do every third Sunday, we'll do a question and answer type lesson. I think I got three questions that I'm going to try to get to tonight, uh, and, and then I'll be done. Um, there are a few questions uh, still that, that I have not been able to get to. Uh, that being said, uh, if y'all want another one of these next week, you got to put in some questions, right? And so um, I, I'm, I'm accepting questions. You could do that either through that email address, garrett at southernhills.net. And there's a box in the back. I think probably the most common to send me a text message or just ask me face to face, and I'll, I'll take them either way. Um, and so we will try to get to these questions. Uh, actually, I, there's a fourth question that I'll probably do next week, maybe, uh, that is just like, I don't have enough time to stick it into one of these. And so it'll probably be its own lesson. But uh, we'll go ahead and do this one, these three this week. The first question is this, and I was kind of disappointed because I wasn't thinking the, uh, the young man who asked me this question actually isn't here tonight. He's on the, the, the trip with Andy. And so uh, I usually try to make sure as much as I can that the person's here who asked the question, but we record them. So. Um, so the question is this, how does Numbers 15, 32 through 36 compare to Jesus' actions and teachings? Uh, we'll get to that passage in just a moment. Um, it's, it's basically a passage that, that deals with uh, the Sabbath day, okay? And, and somebody was not keeping with the Sabbath day, and, and God punishes them uh, really very severely. 
Uh, and, and the idea is that oftentimes one of the most common things that Jesus was ridiculed about uh, by the Pharisees is that they didn't think that he kept the Sabbath or that he, he, he followed the law of the Sabbath. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But before we get to this passage, I, I do want to just look and see what is the regulation about the Sabbath that God has given. It comes from the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 says this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I think it's important to remember the word holy uh, is, is a word that like technically means like set apart. And, and basically the idea is this, you have like seven days in a week, but this Sabbath day is, is different than those other days. It's set apart in a sense from those other days. Um, and you say, well, well why? Like, like what, what's different about it? Well, the sixth day uh, you shall labor. Uh, or six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is with you or within your gates. And, and, and it goes on and we'll read some more in a moment. But, but that's why it's different, right? That, that you have seven days in a week. And, and six of those days, you go ahead and work and labor and, and do all of your work. But the seventh day, you aren't to work. But it's more than just that. And I, I think that this is a really important part. It's not just that I'm not supposed to work. It's that my son and my daughter. Uh, it's that, and I understand, like, I understand this isn't our law. Like, their sons and their daughters. Uh, their, their male servants and their female servants, interestingly, their livestock, even sojourners who, who, who live amongst the people. And so it's not like it's just saying, okay, you are an Israelite, you're not supposed to work, but really like you don't work, but also don't send your son out to plow the back 40, right? I mean, and, and don't send your daughter out to do work at this time. Uh, there might be people who were like, like slave mass, like, like they had servants. And he's like, okay, don't, don't send your servants out to work. Jesus is going to talk about this more, and we'll see the passage in a moment. But, but it was really supposed to be a blessing for the people of Israel. You know, even, even within our society, like, like we have like regulations about the workplace, and, and there are rules that, that I think civilized societies have. Like, like, you don't just work people to the ground. People need a break. People need rest. Sometimes people don't recognize that for themselves. And so God says, no, you need to recognize it for yourself. But not only do you need to recognize it for yourself, you need to recognize it for your servant. Don't work that man to the ground. That woman, don't work her to the ground. Your sons and your daughters and like, like it's, it's a rule for everybody within Israel that they get some rest. Okay, so that is the rule. You say, well, why did God do this? Verse 11 says, for in the sixth day, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, so God in, in his creation work uh, created on day one, two, three, four, five, and six, and then he rested on day seven, and that kind of set this principle. And, and that's what God wants for, for his people, or uh, that was the rule and the regulation that they had, is that like, okay, you rest, but also you, you rest for yourself, but also don't send your, your sons, your daughters, uh, don't, don't send your servants out, like, it, it is a rest for the people, okay? Well, and so now we get to the question about Numbers 15, 32 through 36. Because so what we'll find is that somebody just, just basically disregarded that, right? So the, the, this is what happens, Numbers 15, 32 to 36. says, while the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him in custody because it had not been made clear what should be done to him. Okay, so what happened was there was this guy who just kind of blatantly disregarded the rule. Blatantly disregarded the law. All right, uh, the, 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 the God had a very clear, it's not a hard to understand law. 
on the seventh day, you don't do work. It's, it's not on the seventh day, you don't eat. It's not on the seventh day. Like, like it wasn't like he was walking along the way and he picked up a stick and was like whittling. Like, no, he was gathering, he was working. He was, he was trying to produce and like he was work. He just, just disregarding what God said. And one thing you'll find about God, he's not okay with you just disregarding what he says. Right? And, and so like stories like this, people will read and they'll think, that seems kind of severe. And in reality, yeah, God takes it very seriously. When he says, don't do this, and you say, I'm going to do it anyway, God takes that very seriously. And that's just him. That's his character. That's his right. And so we just need to learn. So, so how severely did God take it? Says the Lord said to Moses, the man shall be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. And all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, we can talk and debate about why God took things so seriously. I, I have my understanding of why that is. And I don't know if it's really here or there, but the point is this, the man disregarded what God said. Okay, so what about Jesus? And, and, and the reason this is asked is because one of the most common things that Jesus was ridiculed for, uh, questioned about, is that the, the Pharisees and the Jews thought that he would often break the Sabbath. And typically what happened, and there's a lot of different places we could turn, and we don't have time to turn to every one of them, but typically what would happen is, is it had to do with healings. That someone was like uh, sick in some way, and Jesus made them better, right? And, and the Pharisee says, well, that's, that's a work, right? They're working on the Sabbath, which obviously isn't mentioned in Exodus chapter 20. If anything, you could say it's a working of God, so you're kind of like holding God to that standard. And like, it, it, it's really not, I don't think, obviously, Jesus didn't take it as a very good argumentation, right? Like, uh, it, it's, it's not what the law of the Sabbath is about, healing somebody. You're allowed to do good even on the Sabbath. Uh, probably the, the, the passage that people question the most comes from Mark chapter 2, uh, verses 23 through 28. And so we'll read through this and just talk about it briefly. It says, one Sabbath he was going through the grain fields and uh, they made, or sorry, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Okay, so what I want you to notice about this, a couple things. First, it wasn't Jesus that they said was breaking the Sabbath. It was his disciples. That's who the claim was against, that his disciples were breaking the Sabbath. But even that, I don't think it's a fair thing to say, because as you look at what they were doing, it wasn't really in violation of Exodus chapter 20. Hard to say that they were laboring, they were hungry, and they ate some food, right? When, when I eat shrimp and I pull that little tail off the end, I'm not saying like, that's not laborious work, I'm, I'm, I'm preparing my food to eat. Right? There are times where you can like, like remove the shell. Like you take a banana and you peel it. That's not work. You're getting ready to eat. And that's essentially what they were doing. They were walking by the way and, and they got some grain and they did what they did. And they kind of got the, I guess the chaff off and, and they, they ate the grain. Right? And, and so not really a violation of what God said. Now, here's the interesting thing about the Pharisees. And we don't have time to get much into it. It's actually a like written document that they had. There was like 39, I think it is, rules that they had attached to that. Like you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. And so it was a violation, not of what God had said, but the application that they put upon it, which I think is a good lesson to us. God's very concerned that we keep his rules, but you don't get to make up your own. Right? And, and that's kind of what they did. And, and that's what the disciples were in, in violation of. And so Jesus made this statement. And this has caused some people some, some concern as well. It says, he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of, the, and, and the, ate the bread of presence. Uh, 
which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who are with him. So some will take this and say that what Jesus did is he said, okay, uh, David violated the law, and so therefore my disciples can do the same. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think rather what he's saying is like, y'all are just, y'all aren't real concerned about a time when David specifically violated the law. He did what was not lawful. He did what he, and, and y'all don't seem to care at all that. Like you, you hold David up as this great man. You pay tribute to him. Like, like you respect David and yet you could point to times where he, he specifically did what was not lawful. And you don't seem to care. But now with my disciples, they're not even breaking the law of God. They're just violating your traditions. And you're, you're getting all kinds of bent out of shape about it. So like it's, 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 it's kind of hypocritical, which, which seems to be Jesus' main argumentation against the Pharisees. Like, that's who they're hypocrites. When something serves their purpose, they don't have a problem with it. But then they were like, like, like dig and try to find any little scruple in your life, even when it doesn't specifically violate the law of God. And so what Jesus says next is this. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Remember when, when God said, okay, you shall not work in, in your sons and your daughters and your male servants and your female servants and your livestock and any foreigner within the land, like you sh- that was to benefit them. If, if you take that and misinterpret it to where like you have to starve on the Sabbath, then, then you're not understanding it. God gave this rule, this law, not to hurt you, but to benefit you. It's the same reason he would heal people. And they would get all kinds of upset about it. You healed on the Sabbath. And Jesus is like, if, if your animal falls into a pit, you're going to help him out. Like, it, it's not a rule about not doing good to people. It's not a rule about not helping. It's not a rule that would lead to you not being able to eat. The rule that God gave, the law that he gave, was actually to bless mankind. And, and so, like, your interpretation of it that hurts, man, it's like you're, you're, you're completely flipping this thing on its head. And he ends by saying, so the man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And so, like, the Lord is, is in charge of Sabbath. I think he understands it and, and what it's about. Right? And so, how does Numbers 15, 32 through 36 compare to Jesus' actions and teachings? Well, in Numbers 15, 32 through 36, there's a person who, who was in direct violation of the law of God, and he's just disregarding what God had said. Jesus did not ever disregard what God had said. He kept the law, and he kept it perfectly, but he refused to, to let uh, a group of Pharisees and, and kind of lawmakers and themselves, these Jews, dictate that. Uh, he kept it in its truth. And so, um, really good question. Next question, do we use the word blessed in the right way? Um, uh, this, this is one of those questions that was just kind of, it was spoken to me. Uh, and so, I, I think, I think he, he phrased it, I think sometimes we use the word blessed wrong, to which I would agree. I, I think that you, you can definitely say that God has blessed us in ways that uh, I, don't, I don't know that we would count those things blessings of God. I think you can use the word too loosely. Now, I'll also say this, though. Words often can be used in several different ways, right? And, and it's not like every word has a single specific meaning. Um, and, and I think a good example of this is found in Ephesians chapter 1. And I went ahead and put it up. Ephesians 1, uh, 3 and 4 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you read that, Paul is writing, what's he doing? Paul is blessing God. Why is he blessing God? He says next, Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so Paul says, I bless God. Why? Because God blessed me. Like, those are two different things. What we do to God and what God did to us are not the same, 
right? Now, the, 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 the word, if you want to know, the Greek word for blessing uh, comes from a Greek word, eulageo. It's where we were to get our word eulogy, right? So, like, when, when I or anybody stands up and, like, preaches a funeral, we often call that, like, a eulogy, right? And the idea is, like, you're getting up and you're saying really good things about this person. Uh, you're, you're pointing out the good, right? So, what Paul does is, is, is he eulogizes God. Like, he, he speaks good of God. He lifts his name up. But when God blesses us, it's not just about speaking good about us. He's actually done really good things to us. How has God blessed us? Well, he blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, that even shows you that there is, there's almost a, a, a couple different blessings in that. There are blessings that are spiritual. There are also blessings that are more physical. Right? So, some blessings from God, like, like physically, like we might say like the food we eat is a blessing from God. Um, uh, we, we might say when God sends rain, it is a blessing from God. The sun rises, it is a blessing from God. Our families are blessings from God. The clothes we wear are blessings from God. Like uh, James said, every good and perfect gift is from above. Like, like all the good stuff we have are blessings from God. What's interesting about all those different blessings, though, is that like they vary. Like some people have a lot of money and some people have less. Some people have everything in the world they want to eat. And, and some people just, you know, get one meal a day type of thing. Like, like so they, they, they vary. And, and what's really interesting about this, and I think sometimes causes people problems, is that sometimes ungodly people seem to have the most of those things. And, and sometimes good people don't have that much of them, right? There's, there's, there's very ungodly people with all kinds of blessings from God physically, all kinds of money. And then there's, there's people who are very good, moral, uh, God-fearing people who struggle financially. Um, and so, like, those blessings vary a little bit. Interestingly, what he says about these blessings is that when someone is in Christ, they receive every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So, while there, there's, like, varying degrees of, like, the physical blessings— Spiritual blessings are a little more consistent. That when, when you're in Christ, he's going to mention some blessings that every one of you in Christ has. Well, and, and we don't have time to go through every one of them, but, but at least verse 4 says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Um, and so, like, what is, is one of those blessings? God chose you. Those who are in Christ are the chosen of God. Like, that's a tremendous physical ble- or, or spiritual blessing. Um, he, he says, you'll be holy and blameless before him. A tremendous spiritual blessing. Um, but it's those who are in Christ. So, like, do we use the word blessed right? I, I do think that sometimes people use it incorrectly. That being said, understand that, that you can vary the way that it is used. Blessings can be physical. Blessings can be spiritual. Blessings can be blessings to God. Blessings can be from God. Blessings can be one to another. And so blessings can be, like, the, the word is used in a lot of different ways. Um, yes, you can misuse it. Uh, I've, I've heard people say, God has blessed me with something. I'm thinking, I don't think God blessed you with that. Like, like I think that's, that's just something you like. That's not necessarily something that is God-given. Um, but so, yes, we can misuse the word, but the word also has a various, uh, various kinds of meanings. Uh, last question, why did God wink at sin in the Old Testament and not now? Uh, there's a reference to Acts 17 and verse 30, which we will look at in a moment. He says, and, and didn't he also require repentance then? And we'll look at why these questions come. Um, I will say this, like, we'll, we'll look at it. I'm going to put up the, the King James Version because the King James Version is the version that uses that language, okay? So it says, uh, Acts 17 and verse 30, at times of ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Okay, a um, couple things I want to point out. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the word ignorance. It doesn't necessarily say that God winked at sin. 
says he winked at ignorance. And we'll talk about that. Um, but secondly, it's this whole concept of winking at sin, which most of your translation, unless you, if you use the King James, that's, that's, that's the language that is used, um, which I'll, if I'm just going to be honest, like, I don't love that translation of it. Um, most translations say that God overlooked it. And, and the reason most translations say he overlooked it, because the word that's used is actually a compound word. It's the word for see, and it's the word for over, right? He overlooked it, or he, he, he kind of looked past it, is basically the idea. So God overlooked ignorance, and I'll, I'll put that, another translation up here in a moment. Uh, he says, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And so why is he saying now he commands people to repent? Didn't he require people to repent then as well? And, and the answer is yes, but we'll go ahead and, and talk kind of what is this verse saying, okay? Uh, again, it comes from Acts chapter 17. Uh, and I do think this is important before we start reading in verse 29. What's happening in Acts chapter 17 is that Paul is on this missionary journey. He's far away from Jerusalem. He's in a place called Athens. Um, and, and he walks into this place called the Areopagus. And he notices all of these different idols. Um, and, and, and all of them seem to be named, but there's one of them that, that has an inscription instead of a name on it. They inscribed it saying the unknown God. Basically, like, like we don't want to offend any gods that we don't know about. And so we're going to put this inscription, the unknown, and we're going to worship this God. We don't know who he is, but if there's a God out there that is offended, like this is us worshiping you as well. Um, and so what Paul does when he goes into this Areopagus is he says, okay, let me explain this unknown God. Let me explain to you who he is. And what he does is he takes it as an opportunity to explain Yahweh, to, to explain our God. And, and so what he does is, is he's talking to these people who are Gentile, these people who do not know God, and he's talking to people who have really never known God, and he's explaining to them who God is. And so he says, being then God's offspring, we ought not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So what you have is you have a people who, I think they were intelligent enough to know that something more powerful is out there. Like, 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 obviously, like, like something is, is kind of making this world function. I don't know what all of their beliefs were, but they were trying to piece this together. And we might ask, like, why didn't they know God? And the truth is, they didn't know God because God hadn't really revealed himself to them. Like, he's not talking about the Jews right here. When Jews were idolatrous, God punished them. But Gentile people were often idolatrous. And you think about like, like why do I know God? Like I just, I just mentioned his name a moment ago, Yahweh. Well, how do I know that? It's because he's told us. Right? And, and, and we get together and we discuss things. And there's even things about God we don't quite comprehend, but we try to wrap our minds around. Like, like, like we, we get this idea of, in Scripture that like there's one God, and yet there's, there's, there's almost different character. Like there, there's, there's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit, who, who all kind of have their own character. But, but they compose in some way this unified God. And, and I'm thinking, okay, how do I know that? Uh, it's because we were told. I would never would have just come up with that. It, it's never something that, that, that I would have just like imagined on my own. The things I know about God, I know about God because God told me. And because I have scripture written out for me and I can read it in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, God's revealed himself and talked about himself and shared himself. And, and so you have these Gentile people who did not have the Old Testament written to him. I don't think, I don't think God overlooks necessarily all the sin. There are things that God puts within us. Murder, 
Like, murder is wrong, and, and everybody should know that. Like, that's, that's almost like instilled in you that murder, and there's certain things that God just created us knowing, and, and you shouldn't violate that and go against that. God didn't just, just, just overlook or wink at every sin, but the sin he's talking about is specifically the sin of idolatry. And he didn't do that for everybody. Uh, the, the people we read about primarily in Scripture, uh, idolatry was a big, big sin. God didn't overlook it when, when Israel turned to idolatry. But for these people, apparently he did. Why? Because they couldn't know. How would they know? And so he says, the times of ignorance God overlooked. The, the times when God hadn't yet revealed himself to you, he overlooked that. He understands you didn't know everything about him when he hadn't revealed himself to you. He overlooked it. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Now you don't have that excuse. Because now Paul is in Athens saying, let me tell you about this God. And now like, like we, like, like Gentile, like I don't have that excuse. Why? Because like God has revealed it. And I can know, and I should know. And so times of ignorance got overlooked, but now God's not saying, oh, Gary doesn't need to know who I am. Oh, Gary's idolatrous, but, you know, all over. No, now, like, there's no excuse now. Because he's revealed it. As a matter of fact, he goes on, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed, and he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The knowledge of God. And the raising of Jesus from the dead was not just proof for the Jew. It was proof for everybody. When God sent his son into the world and, and Christ died for the world, that message of the cross was not for one nation of people, it was for the world. And now there's no one in the world who the message is not for. The message is, and, and, and what's the great commission, go to all the world, right? There's no longer just one nation of people who has the revelation of God, who God has made himself known to. Now there's the entirety of the world. And God says, no one is without an excuse now. Or no one, no one is having this sin overlooked. No one uh, is getting out of this day of judgment when God's going to judge the world in righteousness. Now he commands everybody, all men, everywhere, to repent. And so, did God wink at sin in the Old Testament? I, I wouldn't say he winked at sin in the Old Testament. Like, you, you just ask, you know, uh, you go through the list. Ask Sodom and Gomorrah if God winked at sin. Like, no, no, he didn't really wink at that, right? I mean, and, and you go through the list, David sometimes, and, and different. Like, God wasn't winking at sin. God overlooked some ignorance, and the reason he overlooked ignorance is because there's a reason they were ignorant. He didn't reveal himself to them. But now that he's revealed himself to everybody, he commands all men everywhere to repent. Uh, and so I hope that somewhat answers the question. Uh, as mentioned, I, I got, I think, two questions left that I, I haven't had time to get to. Um, but, but please submit some more questions before next month so we can continue uh, doing these question and answers. I, I've enjoyed them. I hope uh, you have as well to some degree. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and offer this invitation now. If there's anyone in here who's not yet a Christian, uh, we would love to help you become one. Uh, certainly, as, as, as I always do offer, if we can study with you or pray with you, if there's anyone who needs to be baptized, we would love to help you in any way we can. Uh, come to know God, uh, to submit your life to Him. If there's something we can do, we give you this opportunity to sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing the invitation song. Have you a heart that's weary? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do not.
de ser. The table has been left prepared for those of you that have not, been, had, not had an opportunity to partake. Um, to prepare our minds for this, I'd like to read a few verses from 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse number 19. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did, not re he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It's at this time that we remember Jesus, his example, the fact that he's our savior, that he's the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Let's pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for blessing us with this opportunity to assemble around this table. We're grateful for your son, his willingness to take on flesh, live that perfect life, suffer at the hands of sinners, and be willing to die on a cross to bear the penalty for the sins of all of humanity. Father, at this time, we remember his body that was beaten, that was bruised, that the blood flowed from, as they nailed his hands and his feet to the tree. We thank you for his body. We remember his body as we partake of this loaf. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need the emblems, please raise your hands. Father, we continue our prayer, remembering the blood that flowed from his body. The, the blood that gives us the forgiveness of sins. We're grateful for that blood. We're grateful for the forgiveness of sins that have accrued to us because he was willing to go to the cross for us. As those of us who partake of this fruit of the vine that represents that blood, we pray that we remember everything that Jesus has done for us. We offer this prayer through him, amen. We also have an opportunity to give back if you were unable to give back this morning, uh, that, uh, that opportunity will be afforded to you. 
Um, the men will come back with uh, collection plates, or if you'd rather give online, we have that uh, available as well. Let's pray. Our Father, you have so richly blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the, in the heavenly places for those of us who are in Christ, with physical blessings without number. We are so grateful for how you provide for us. Father, as we give back a portion of what you have blessed us with, we pray that we give cheerfully, generously, um, without hesitation, so that the work here might continue and that we might uh, save more souls and continue to sanctify those that are already saved. Thank you for giving us everything that you bless us with. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been great to see you all today, and it's been wonderful to worship with you. Uh, if you're visiting tonight, thank you so much uh, for attending here at Southern Hills. We hope that you can spend a little bit of time with us after services and let us get to know a bit more about you. Uh, we'd like for, to invite everyone to be back Wednesday night for a midweek Bible study at 7 p.m., and of course next Sunday at 9 a.m. for a morning worship service. We'll close tonight by singing number 886, and then we'll be dismissed with a prayer. And let's stand for both the song and the prayer. Sing Closing prayer. Lord, we come before you now and we thank you for this wonderful day that we've had of worship to you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the edification that we've had by singing with one another and from the uh, encouragement we've had and, and the information we've had from, from hearing lessons about you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to ask these questions to our preacher Garrett and we hope that you be with him, pray that you be with him and the answers that he gives to us. Uh, so that we can learn more about you and more that we would ha more of what you would have us do, Lord. Uh, today we especially thank you for all of our fathers, Lord. Uh, we thank you for what blessings they are for us, uh, and we pray for our fathers that they can continue to lead us spiritually. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus, who came to this earth to die for us, that we can have hope of one day being with you. And in His name, we pray. Amen. Amen.